You know what's amazing, Ted? I think about uh, Bone. <laughs> is that like we all have this incredible memory of college, but then there's this this epicness to what your son's going through this year. Oh, it's fucking crazy, dude. Welcome to GTM Unfiltered, hosted by GTM veterans Judge Warco, Craig Rosenberg, and Matt Amundsen. We make talking business fun and sometimes funny. That's because we're always unscripted, unfiltered, and unlike anything else out there. Get ready. I mean, it's crazy. His, his son's a backup quarterback for Washington. So, like, and I mean, do you so, see? So he's never going to play. Uh, not this year. <laughs> well, you never know. So the um, you're right. Uh, if he's if he's playing, it's garbage time. You never know. He might get in against Stanford. But you're right. With Penix is the man. And he's taking care of business on his Heisman run. So you're absolutely right. As long as he doesn't get hurt, but hopefully what he'll do is he'll get like, it'll be kind of like a little Jimmy Garoppolo story, like back up an amazing person. And suddenly you've picked up so much that you're, you're the next one. It's got to happen. I don't want it to happen. It's he's third string. So it's, he's a little deeper. (laughs) Got it. Still had to be pretty good. That's a D one top college. So. He made the travel team, and he's in. Did you, did you watch the game, Rosenberg? I did. I watched it. Were you watching, baby? I had to watch it later because everyone told me it was the greatest game of the year. And then I went and watched it. I can't believe because, by the way, Bo Nix played great too. I mean, like it, that was. I mean, truly, I never do this, but Dan Lanning may have really like when I, I always find it overrated when people blame the coach for the loss. That's ugh, like Penix in two plays, like dude. After that fourth down call, I mean, like, I, a, oh, you know, Teddy. Do you, so you see Teddy on TV when you look at it? Oh, dude, the guy's just awesome. He's that's oh. what I mean. He's having a blast, dude. Having a blast, and Judd. Just so you know, he he's calling the play, so he's like, you know, he yeah. feels like he's adding values in the mix. Nice. But dude, that um that sequence where they were um where UW went for it four times in a row from within the the with inside the one was fucking crazy. And so when you Matty A, what's up, dude? How you doing, brother man? So much what? better now. Oh man, you look you he had a haircut guy. too. Oh, what the fuck? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was haircut season. It's so good right now, it's crazy. <laughs> Are you in sales? <laughs> I want to buy. I want to buy. Really buy. Hello. Oh, it's good to see you. Are we talking what UW football? Yes, yeah. we are. So good timing. So that. So literally, Rosen Helly. The, the whole. Um, the whole. You know, the tail of the tape is lack of conversion on fourth down, because Oregon had happened in three times, and and UW had happened to them inside the one four straight shots and Teddy's stories are always pretty classic you know but this game because it's him the OC and Caitlin DeBoer the head coach nobody else on the headset and so it's like this the the conversations he's hearing are pretty classic and and he's like usually Michael Penix who's a great guy he's a total stud he when he comes out of a play and gets on the phone to talk to them the whole crew he is very much a yes yes sir highly respectful on that teddy goes i've never heard him he was screaming f bombs he was so pissed fuck this fuck that put it in my fucking hands what are you guys doing and dude you dub uh, oregon was winning the trenches they won as maddie as matt can can Re- celebrate the fucking O line and D line for for Oregon was money. Yeah, you know? they have great. They have great. They, they, they had that game. I mean, they had that game. And so I don't think it. I don't know about the coaching thing. It's like when you can run the ball and gain six yards every single time, like they were. I mean, yeah, it's a miracle yeah. that they went four three times fourth and three and didn't convert. A miracle. Yeah, awesome. Well, I, I will say, uh, just because I do like to toot my own horn. Uh, oh, there he is. Yeah, here we go. There he is. Very man. infrequently right about anything. But uh, I told Craig, UW was winning the game. And if they won, that Penix would be the favorite for the Heisman. And that Uh-oh. seemed to have come true. 
Wow. You said, even well, you said no, hold on. It was an even better prediction. You said the reason they're going to win is because it Penix's Heisman's on the line, national championships on the, like there was so there was a personal and te- there was so much on the line. Yeah. And it worked because Penix jumped. He's like the the he's the favorite going away now to win the Heisman. Yeah. He, he only is because USC crapped the bed. Come on. But they but here's the thing, Judd. Silently SC's been crapping the bed for weeks. Oh no, no, I, I know and I agree. And I, I honestly don't think he should have been the front runner for the Heisman, but that doesn't mean that what we think is always gonna come to fruition. And I think that that was the battle for the Heisman, that that the the Oregon Yeah, I, game. I, mean, I mean Caleb goes off against Notre Dame. It's very hard to win a Heisman back to back, almost impossible. Yes. Right. If, if he if he had crushed them. Yeah. He might have because people actually had them losing to Notre Dame anyway. Yeah, even though they were ranked higher. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. they're 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 better. SC is not. Caleb's unreal, but I, he lost the Heisman on this against Notre Dame, yep. I and mean, he was making terrible calls. That was like you know Three what I mean? interceptions never happened before. Bad and bad ones calls. too. It wasn't like um, Penix had an had a pick on at the on Saturday with the Oregon game. And it was because Rome, who never falls out of his route, fell out of his route. And so the, it was like, it wasn't like a dis- bad decision. Yeah. yeah. But man, you guys, that game was electric in person. It was just, it was so awesome. It was great. So he's, he's loving it. He's stoked. So, so shall, fun, funny shall thing, we, you, shall we dispense with the pleasantries at this time, Ted? What, what pleasantries? <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> and I'm Judd. So there you go. Um, <laughs> All right. Is it? I was going to say, we we literally built this off of the idea that we love like the sports talk shows, right? Like they're fun. Yeah. You're going to have an interesting conversation and people are going to get heated whether you like it or not. So yeah. I love that we we started that way. So thank you. Well, let me ask you this. Do you love your background? Because the whole gray palette of like your salt and pepper beard, the, the your, your, your hoodie and the backdrop, it's exceptional. You should talk to the other two guys about fine tuning this, this guy's in sales he's good we gotta have uh, him back <laughs> I'm, Ted, I'm trying to tone match with a screen to I was imp- I was impressed I'm not, I was impressed come on uh, uh, although yeah. although Ted I will say I love that that picture that that painting looks it's popping Thank because you, yeah. of the the room it's great Thank you I, I appreciate it I I it was funny because this, this is something that I, it's my favorite place in the world. It's on the North shore of Kauai looking down onto Hanalei Bay. And I found this painter that this artist who is like specializes in that style, but Hawaii. And um, I got introduced to him by a common buddy, surfing friend. And so I called him I'm like, dude, have you ever seen the view from this location? And he's like, no, he's like, but I'm going to Kauai in like three months. So I sent him there and he called me from that spot. He goes, it's ridiculous. And I'm like, dude, paint, I'll, I'll buy, I'll, I'll, I'll paint it. I'm, I'm buying that painting. And what's funny is my wife literally, I mean, she's COO of the household, as long as we're not making that public, you know what I mean? Catch my drip. She thinks she's CEO. And, and, but she is, I'm just kidding. But literally she goes, that painting is not going on our wall. <laughs> and I'm like, what? You gotta be kidding me. I had it in like our master bedroom. And then I had it in the hallway and it just kept getting delegated. So when COVID hit and I was like, zoom central, I'm like, well, if I can look at that, you know, now I'm stoked. So it's all good. Yeah. Get to look at it all the time. We so, love you too, Craig. Uh, oh, <laughs> you know, I don't I don't need any of that. So I'm good, man. Um, so uh, no, I mean I need <laughs> but I don't need, you don't need anything. Craig's I don't good. need compl- I don't need compliments from you. So yeah. the uh um well, so I just Thank wanted you. to bring up uh uh why we have Ted Purcell on the call. Oh wow. And then <laughs> wow. and then I'm gonna lead with a big question for you. So um oh. look, I've known Ted forever and um I just you know, he's got a longer background, but I just, there's some important points here. So one is uh, he was at SAP selling big hellacious deals for 10 years and helping others on his team sell big hellacious deal, then leading teams selling big hellacious deals. And he has incredible stories from that time. But here's the thing is he went from 
the big enterprise classic sell uh, into SaaS, right? So he, he, his next move, he brought in what, you know, volume and velocity, um, which, um, you know, he did, I would say incredibly, like the transition was incredibly successful. It's actually very hard, uh -huh. right? Like to go from doing one deal a year for 40 million to having to get to 40 million by doing 10,000 deals. Right. And so like that, that uh, is one of the big things I've always been impressed with. Right. And then, you know, he, he went to Marketo had commercial sales and was like, I mean, I, I'm not sure everyone knows, but like Ted was given no extra budget to raise revenue and he did. And the moves that he made were incredible there. Like I've just, it's been in awe watching the guy. Now he's the CRO at Teely. I mean, he's been there for like, what, four or five years now. I mean, it's crazy. Fully vested. We love it. <laughs> Always like to hear fully vested. That's so he's been able to, he's been able to see all points of sales in the, you know, in technology. Well, I started his SDRs together. That's the best part to me. Yeah, well, Ted, man, I, I mean, that guy is, he's been epic ever the moment I like walked in. I was like, that dude's epic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, hey, can I, can I ask a quick question? I know you've got one teed, but like that really leads me to something that I have a question for, especially from a seller like that and a leader. Uh, is that okay, Craig? That's fine. If you want to break from the script that we decided on weeks ago, go ahead. I, you know me. I hate scripts. I'm horrible at them. I, I'll let, I'll let you go back. Complain that we don't nail everything. I I'm, know. I, I'm the worst. I'm the worst. I promise. No, go but, for it. But it's, I in the podcast, it's in the podcast description that we don't have scripts. So please. Yeah, there you go. So, That's true. Uh, unscripted, unfiltered, baby. That's true. Go ahead. Go ahead. So it better be good, but go ahead. Yeah. I, I'm I'm hoping. So so I've had these conversations recently with a bunch of CROs and and sales leaders, and I always like to get the take of somebody who's been at different types of sales, different types of companies. A lot of people always look for they've been there, they've done that as a telltale that they will be successful again. The playbook, right? Do you believe that the playbook is a, is the thing, or do you believe it's your ability to figure stuff out and be a great leader? Simple. the latter. You know, I feel like the world has completely changed in the last. <laughs> it keeps changing. Yeah. And I would say that Craig, he when he and Scott Albro worked together and I was transitioning to that modern revenue machine, as, as I like to call it, I love that term. Um, you may have invented it. I don't know if we did together, you did, Craig, but I love that term. And it's just more of what he was talking about earlier around having an all bound based approach where everyone's, you know, working. And of course, the all bound approach works better in product led growers and the SaaS industry over the last 10 to 15 years, with the exception of the last three, it's been so focused to maybe two years that has been so focused on product led growers in conjunction with that all bound based approach. So you can templatize these playbooks and just get these playbooks down. So easy. Well, it's easy to do when it's 0% interest rates, you can invest in people process everything without any questions. And everyone feels like they can't buy software fast enough because they can't keep up with their competition in the market, which opens everyone's TAM up massively. And I'll tell you what, this has been the biggest challenge of my entire sales career the last three years, four years. I, you know, like you said, I've been at Team for four years and we are the enterprise leaders in our category, the customer data platform category. And we have an amazing product and amazing team, but it's been insanely hard for all of us to go through what you're talking about. Is it, do you create a playbook because then it needs to change like every quarter or every six months? And product market fit is constantly this vision you're chasing, but it's changing because of the competitive context and the partner involvement in the category, let alone are people hiring roles and responsibilities in the category to support the, the, the category that you are in um, to the point where you can augment your customer journey and your CS team, or is you relying on your CS team for staff aug purposes just to convince people to stay, it, it, all that stuff comes in. And so Judd, to your point, it's leadership and change management. It's- yeah, I, yeah, he, he, he just dropped the mic. 
That was a good question, actually. So I will give you <laughs> thank you. I thank you, Greg. So if so all things like uh do you th one thing i've been wor worried about like kind of so there's like two worrisome elements of playbook hiring like one is you always go for the person who's been there done that and is successful for you sure. know staff organ it's like but but dude this is like nobody's blowing through the roof right and so like is that really the key element you're looking for and then number two is like in your case i mean do you like is it better, worse, the same, or it just depends on the person, whether they have a background in CDP or a background, you know, selling to your persona or like, so on both of those things, like the, those are sort of classic playbook elements, right? Hey, I need to hire people from Salesforce, right? Yeah. Or, you know, and it's like, uh, and actually when, the, you know, going back to Ted's like zero interest rates and everything's going to scale and most of what you do works, you might as well, you know, like that, that seems good. Uh, but like now uh, is, as you said, has changed. So it feels like those two things are sort of broke. I don't know, like, t I would love if you talk more about like, how, you know, is that leadership and decision-making ability clearly sounds like that's the most important thing. How do you, what do you look for to find that? How do you test for it, et cetera? Because that is what everyone needs to figure out right now. Well, <laughs> If somebody, if you talk to somebody that does have it figured out, then please let me know. I'd love to talk to them. Man, it, it's the grit that's required to grind through these things. I mean, the whole, it, it, I just kind of, I, I, I have maximum respect for people that have spent time at whatever company it is in whatever part of the journey that it is and have succeeded. Don't get me wrong. It's amazing. Um, Salesforce back in the day, I mean, again, I don't want to oversimplify this for people that may listen to this are like, dude, you got to be kidding me. But it's, you know, going to sell Salesforce in the last 10 years has been, it's been a good decision the yeah. last 15 years. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, speaking from a guy that was at SAP for 10 years, like you mentioned, where you know you have the ability to leverage this bill of materials, the complexity and the value of a 300 page price list to move things around. You've got massive spins to be able to negotiate. I mean, I this is the 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 industry high tech playbook. I don't care if it's Xerox and IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, SAP, Adobe, Salesforce, go down the list. The big tech titans play this card. So for, for me, you know, when you look at people that have had backgrounds at big companies with success, I always look at that to say, well, you may have been in the right place at the right time. You may have had the right account list. Let's, I mean, let's call it like it is in these big companies. You need to, you want to have the right account list. Like I always look at people that didn't have the right account list that weren't selling in the core ICP of the company, but still made it happen. Yeah, yeah. Those were always the types of people that I just looked at and just had maximum respect and admiration for when I was growing up in the business. And even now when I'm trying to hire and look for people in our business, you know, th this whole, you know, the product led grower stuff, this is not, obviously it's the opposite of sales led growth. And as we enter back into the world, that's quite frankly, probably ideally a combination of both. Um, and don't get me wrong, the product-led growers have been amazing. And the fact that that came around and obviously outside, you know, capital investors want to, you know, the, the leanness of a product-led grower is amazing. But you guys know the challenges on that easy come, easy go in a lot of ways. And it's still, that's not the template no brainer at this point. Um, so a, a highly consultative, trusted advisor resources is the secret to sales. Yeah. And people want to buy and do business with people that they trust and that say what they mean and they mean what they say. And don't get me wrong. Everyone's aggressive and everyone respects the appreciation you're trying to make deadlines, whether it's project delivery deadlines, if you're consuming, implementing, managing and maintaining tech or whether you're chasing a quota, whatever it is. Deadlines are deadlines and people need to be respectful about how they approach it, but that aggressiveness behind it 
the tenacity, the grit to grind through what that is like that. That's, you know, that's very, very difficult to interview for. Yeah. It's the reason yeah. why I always tell my kids, like your brand is always on display, even though you're in high school and college, your brand and your network is always on display. And if you're showing yourself, your personal brand, I'm using this, I'm overusing this term, I think, maximum respect, that's my favorite <laughs> Um, it then you are going to find yourself in a better position. I don't care what endeavor it is that you chase. If you're a doctor, an attorney, if you're in tech, in whatever position you may be in, or if you're in the podcast business, relationships are important. Trust and authenticity, I think, are important. And those are the things I try to smoke out. And I will say the hardest thing in human nature is to change change is like breaking bones getting people to change and do things differently it's hard and it's hard for me it's hard for everybody and i like it when change happens and you see success from that change or happiness from that change i'm stoked on it but the willingness to do that everyone says they'll change but i'll tell you what very it's very it's it's more of a rarity than it is a standard and somehow i'm looking for trusted advisor passionate you're intellectually curious, willing to change people that don't lack grit. Yeah. All right. I got two things. One is, damn it, because Judd, that turned out to be a great question. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I think we got the title for today's podcast, which is Ted Purcell breaks down how to cultivate your brand on LinkedIn. That's what I got. That, that's what everybody that's got. That's all you heard. This, all you heard. this, this is a mark. We got to get rid. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, Actually, you know, yeah. Go, go the, ahead. Uh, just, is I just did a, a webinar with Doug Landis, right? And we were talking about grit. That if we had to choose right now, grit is the single most important thing to look for in a sales rep. And I'm like, well, how do you look for grit? And he sent me this. Have you seen this Angela Duckworth grit scale? No, I'd love to see it. Yeah, I'll. I'll we'll. Uh, we'll put it in the podcast notes. I'm just kidding. You I, guys I, can get it. You know how many people say that, and I've like I I've never seen podcasts. Uh, yeah, I'll 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 send it over to you guys. But basically, it's this grit scale, and it's like a series of questions to get your score on how basically your level of grit. It's awesome, and uh, but but I like that you used the word grit. It was a trigger for me because we were just talking about like how important grit is. And that's actually, so you know what, the question I was going to ask you is like, what's something that uh, that would like is surprising to the market today that they think they know, but they're wrong about and what you need to go do about. It? And I think one of the things that they don't know about is we just had this conversation. You might say something different, but that like that you have to hire someone. The most important factors are, were they in market? Were they successful? before were they at a company that was successful before versus trusted advisor relationship le you know that level of the ability to go do that and grit right yeah. and like those are things that i'm not sure like judd wouldn't have asked the question if he didn't think because it was a you know it was a lead like he's like man i i mean i'm hearing this out there so uh yeah i mean I, it feels like that's kind of you know your thing on what the what's different than how people look at how to be successful and go to market. And you would say, well, you know, I'm going to tell you that you're wrong and here's what you're going to do about it. <laughs> well, uh, well said. I don't know if there's a question there, but I think I know what I'm going to say next. The uh, is that the biggest challenge I see right now is you people, especially when you're in a downturn, or you're in a challenging economic environment, it's hard for people to show curiosity while at the same time trying to convince whomever they're talking to, they know how to do their job. Mm. And being curious and being open, it's a, it's a very fine line between, wait, do you even know what to do? But when people come in with that background and that experience that you're referencing, Rosenberg, I you know, it's almost like, okay, well, too much of that means you're not as open and curious to what is actually happening. And what, what I will say is selling software, supporting software, or the go-to-market game in high tech, which is really what we're all in the world of, 
I don't think people know how to buy software and they think they do. They think they know their own process. They think that they know their own company. And as, as go to marketers or revenue, um, or revenue generators, um, you want to put in mutual agreement, close plans. You want to be, you want to speak in terms of business outcomes and value that can be expected to be generated and realized and, beginning the cadence together so it's consistent and so that we're gauged together in that consultative trusted advisor context that we were talking about. But you, the, I can't tell you how many, how, how often, or I think almost every time that you're, that a customer is saying, even if they're a senior executive, that they say they know how to buy software, they know what their internal process is, they know who's on vacation or not. They know who has to sign or what gates are in place, especially in large enterprise product led growers, totally different because you buy with a credit card, but then, or whatever. But then eventually when you're trying to grow larger deals, this comes into play. So it comes into play for everybody. But when trying to inspect that, when the, the customer oftentimes is like, you know, I know my business, I know my company. But in this environment, a CFO and the CEO and their board and whatever executive operating committee is running that company, they are making changes to how they're going to operate the business every day. So technically, by that definition, the waterfall back from that means what they approve and allow to be invested in the business is also changing every day. So therefore, anything that you thought you knew about your internal process last week, last month, let alone last year, it's changing daily. Yeah. And finding that level of curiosity to in process and building constantly changing and evolving mutual agreement plans to say, this is what we need to do. And, you know, ideally I like to back into the go live. So it's not about the event of the deal. It's you, there people are investing in tech to have an outcome and to generate value from an investment. And as executive teams are trying to evaluate, do I invest in, in, in real estate? Do I invest in people? Do, what is it that I invest in with my bucket of cash now that cash is so precious and that process and that curiosity that comes from um, from from that and how you how you recruit and how do you you know enable and hold accountable that mindset, man, it's it's a major challenge. It's a it, it's changing each and every day, and that's a little bit more detail behind the grind that's needed because I think it plagues everybody. Yeah. That's okay. Awesome. Matt, I actually want to get your take on something. So, so hold on one sec, because th this is important. So I, I heard, T Ted, you said something that, that I've been kind of preaching for a while now about personal brand and like, we're in an era of trust. I, and I believe that kind of, we're going back in time, 80, 90 sellers were trust relations, you know, big deals didn't happen overnight. They built trust and uh, rapport over long term. And right now I think we're entering back into a time where trust is even more important than data. Uh, okay. So, so. I kind of would love to hear between you and Matt, because I, I feel that between sales and marketing, there's different approaches to this from personal brand development to uh, the, the way that we do our marketing and positioning and POV work. So between you two, like what's the right approach right now with the way the market is currently going, knowing it's going to change, but what we can control are things that we should be trying to control. What, what are these things, guys, sales and marketing, and how are you guys working together to make it happen? Yeah. I mean, I think for a long time we fell back on the like, Hey, we've got a customer success story. We've got G2 crowd reviews. And I'm not saying those things aren't valuable, but they don't serve the same level of value that they used to maybe seven or eight or 10 years ago, or maybe even as recent as three years ago, or during the pandemic when people could just be like, cool, they've got three or four customers that look just like me, check box. I'm good to go. So I think, I think, uh, marketing is struggling to demonstrate an ability to be trusted because people's trust in case studies, people's trust in G2 crowd reviews or other, other third-party reviews has eroded. Um, I think the, I still believe in the trust that you can drive from a good analyst report, um, but not everybody operates in a category that has waves or quadrants. So that can be challenging. 
I think uh, I think that this is the hardest time ever to be a seller. And I like there have been times where as a marketer, I can be adversarial with sales he, here. I am as empathetic as I've ever been in my career because it is so hard to sell right now. You will get people showing up on your doorstep with a demo request that is like, I want exactly what you sell and they still won't buy from you, even if you prove all the value because things change. People, you know, we we don't see the big gigantic layoffs the way we were seeing, but people are still getting like sort of quietly let go and these smaller rifts and things like that. Like one day that person's there, next day that person's not there anymore. And, and so like, it's just such a challenging landscape. I do believe uh, uh, wholeheartedly in what Ted said, which is people don't know how to buy software anymore. I think this is especially true if you're at a younger company or in an emerging category where people have never bought that software before. And so creating, uh, yeah. creating a plan for your buyer around, this is the way most people evaluate software. It sounds silly, but it really matters. I think most people believe that their problems are unique, uh, and I think sellers want to create a bespoke uh, selling experience for their customers. But actually, most people want to feel like their problems are common, that there is a right and wrong way to do something. And all I want to do is like, I'm, I maybe care less about doing what's right. Just please don't let me do what's wrong, <laughs> right? Like, I don't want to buy the wrong thing that's going to get me fired right now. I don't want to go through a sales cycle with you uh, for six months only to find out that my CFO will not uh, support this or this transaction. So I think you have to be really cautious. And I am advocating largely now for, for a sales process, not necessarily a marketing process, but a sales process that is highly consultative. The one where you know the sales reps are taking much more extreme care than what they had to do maybe in the during the pandemic times where someone was showing up with a you know a request for a demo or yeah I'll take your phone call and yeah I want to buy that thing cool like here's your contract and off we go people just aren't buying like that anymore anytime there's a sales rep involved at any company it's just not happening sales cycles are getting longer there's more and more people involved in the buying committee than ever before. Uh, and threading that needle for for sales reps is just it's it's really, really hard. But I think, and I don't want to just repeat what Ted said, but he did a really great job of outlining what are the steps. Be curious, care about what people want. Uh, care about the direction that their com company's going in. I think in a lot of cases, we what I hear from sales reps is they take information at face value. I want to do this. I want to have a thing that does this. And we sort of accept that as opposed to saying, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Why? Why is that so important to you? And Or maybe why is that different now than it was six months ago? We just kind of let things sit out there a little bit. And, and it is also from a human perspective, I can see their trepidation to press too much because they're like, oh, I don't want to be playing 20 questions with this person. They're going to go buy from my competitor because I'm grilling them. So it is such a tightrope right now to walk where you can present yourself as a trusted advisor, not just a seller, but also a seller who's not going to let a big fish off a hook. So no answers other than there's some tactics that we need to be utilizing uh, uh, as, as a salesperson or as a sales team in order to get there. I, I, I apologize for not having a good marketing answer. Well, you know, it may, that I think that's well said, man. I, I, you know, when digital marketing came about, the whole idea was how can we create our brand, let alone whatever that is. Let's use the the thesis of trust and authenticity, like we're talking about right now. Sure. It was how do you do that at scale in a non personal way, because previous to websites or web provided content or G2 crowds or whatever it is where people go to do 80% of their due diligence about a purchase before they even speak to a seller. They used to get that from a seller. They used to be educated. What products are coming out? What are you offering? So your education was through the lens of a seller. So by nature, you had to be you had to have a, a a way in which you engaged people in in I the most successful people at least were the ones that did it in a trusted 
authentic, fun, whatever you want to say, all that likable way. And I think that that marketing point back to your question, Judd, um, you know, creating that trust and authenticity at scale is still it's so important. And it just addresses a different part of the engagement life cycle mm. because you're not going to be able to get deep because if you get deep, you confuse people, you get into the weeds, you need to be at that right level, but you need to have the right orchestrated process and team that takes it and knows that that context has been set. So then it allows you to get into more detail, but it's, it's, you know, how do you get, you know, an inch deep and a mile wide early on enough to gain the credibility to get to the table. But then as soon as a person interacts and you start asking qualification questions, Man, I, I mean, I think Rosenberg, you used the term collaborative value discovery a few years ago. You yeah, were thank oh. you. Wow. And, what about a concierge based sales process, Ted? <laughs> I, I, I By the way, look. as you talk, don't get distracted. I'm so excited. I got to go stand up desk. So you may hear some noises. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I remember you, you got I, him I, to stand up, Ted. That That's huge. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How about home space mentality? I love that, but I used to love the collaborative value discovery because it was really meant to do what we're talking about right now. But, you know, how do you get trusted enough that you're going to educate people when oftentimes, man, especially in my cat in my category, there's a lot of people that use the term that we use, maybe, you know, a hundred plus, plus the every one of the big companies. How do you create authenticity, trust, and, and, and differentiation? And at the same time, not just what you're selling, but going back to what we were saying a little bit earlier, defining the engagement life cycle so you know what's going to happen and when so that you can plan properly, let alone forecast back to your team so that they can set the expectations on the whole litany of demand and supply that you need, whether it's people or cloud infrastructure or whatever it is it is so challenging it's insane and yeah. i would just say that the multitaskers that are thinking through that lens of grit based authenticity and trust and being as curious and and changeable and convincible the things in your own mind aren't what you're hearing that they think that they are i mean it's just it's crazy. It, it, it's just, it's a real challenge. And so I, I just feel like th that sales and marketing alignment, taking that high level one to many personalization, defining what it is that you're on and that brand trust promise, a, a brand promise, which may be trust, like we were talking about, and then preparing that next level below that in the consultative context that Maddie was talking about is, is the way to go about it. And I feel like that's the most successful way to do it. Yeah. Wait, did you just invent grit based authenticity? <laughs> we're we're inventing stuff on the fly. Uh, no, that's and, Ted. You just don't know. Ted will invent a saying or a phrase on every conversation you have with them, and if he likes it, you'll hear it again. I say with that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and so he doubled down on it. I, okay, I got I got one that I think I've got the right three people on here to ask because between the three of you. There's going to be a, maybe the exact same opinion or a lot of varying opinions. I'm a big believer that currently, as it stands, the SDR, BDR motion is dead. It is not working. It has not worked for a while. I don't think it's going to work in the way it works currently. Maybe save one instance where you put that into some type of campaign-specific structure. What are your thoughts on this broken up sales uh, and, and marketing motion and What's the solution at this point? Because I am a believer we are in what I like to call the multiplier economy, that you have to create so much trust and value throughout the entire process that if you're not creating a multiplier at every step, you lose before you get to the end. So the SDR motion, in my opinion, kind of breaks that. What are your all thought? And, I, and honestly, this is for all three of you, because I think you three are very, very specifically qualified to speak to this stuff. I'd love to hear from you guys on this one, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough question. I think uh, I think the the value of having an SDR or a BDR or whatever you're calling them today sort of 
cold calling into an organization and trying to um, drum up interest uh, and actually turning that interest into a real sales cycle is, I don't know, I, like I, I never like to say something's definitively dead. It's just, it's not effective at all. And I think like in just about every sector that that is true, the, 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 the sort of cold outbound prospecting, um, I still think that there can be value in the right organization to have sort of a, a, a value added benefit where somebody can have a conversation with a prospect before they speak to a salesperson. Uh, but it can't, it's, it's got to add value and not just for your own brand, but to the prospect, they should be able to learn something from that experience before they go on. That should get them excited to go have the next call, though excited may be, uh, maybe too hyperbolic that, that at least like gives them momentum to go into the next call. Um, I think if you still run a heavily inbound motion, uh, an SDR can be very valuable in terms of, you know, providing resources to, to, to folks that are coming through the inbound. Hey, I'm not really ready to talk to a salesperson. I need to know more information about this. Let me give you some resources. Hey, we're doing a webinar on this, whatever you can come join that. I think the person who's trying to push somebody into a meeting who's truly not ready, that's never really worked and is especially not working now because I do think you can get some brand erosion from an experience like that. So I think if you can build a motion for your SDRs that enables them to personify your brand and create a great experience for a person in whatever interaction you want them to have with a prospect or customer, then it's still meaningful. But by and large, most people don't run SDR that way. Yeah. So first of all, Judd, um, did you just, I, I, the reason I didn't answer first is I was trying to pick myself off the ground because you said what I like to call the multiplier economy. Yeah. <laughs> that was Ted Purcell-esque, don't you think, man? I mean, he, that was- He, he motivated, I just, okay. I could feel it off of him. <laughs> and then number two is, is dead- so, I mean, look, I, here's, I'll just restate the problem. We are in like um, a nuclear pipeline um, moment here because one is a lot of the things on the, on Matt's tool set are not working that great, right? Like the yeah. paid search and content syndication and like just basically form fills in general, right? Mm -hmm. uh, webinars, you know, all, all those things that were like play, the playbook for demand gen, those things broke, right? Now they're not dead, right? They're not dead. The SDRs aren't dead. It's just, here was the issue is that what we used to do is we'd say, okay, well, cool. So marketing's going to do a marketing led pipeline because they got this playbook there to come in. They're going to run this thing. They're going to drive these MQLs, or even if they do ABM, whatever that might be, they had this plan. We filled the rest of the pipeline with outbound SDRs. So we were like, the, everyone's talking about how they have this pipeline. Uh, there's a crater in the pipeline. Well, yeah, because you used to just go, you know what, just go hire 30, 20 or some kids and just give them a sales engagement tool and let's go. And we could fill the rest, right? Now you can't. So in that case, Judd, you are right. Like that that model uh, has sort of crumbled a bit and fallen apart. Now, I will say we don't know the next step, right? Because we had a messaging problem and we didn't care. That was part of the issue for 12, 13 years, whatever you want to call it. Like, you know, I remember we'd go in and I'd have some fancy term and we'd go train the SDRs and they'd say, this is great. And then it didn't matter because the SDRs could run a templated outbound push into particular personas and they would send enough so that they could get meetings. Nobody cared. Yeah. Because it worked fine. Mediocre worked fine. And now, um, so we're just paying the price on mediocre. That's why, like, um, you know, there's new tools that will allow us to to enable SDRs to add more value. They going cold is the issue, right? Like, if you in a coordinated attack, right, like a a orchestrated um, campaign, where because brand matters on on response rates, right? It just does now, right? And that's why, you know, a lot of the things that were sort of traditional marketing these come into play here. If nobody will do, even with great messaging, a, a I mean, not nobody, but 
a call, an email from someone asking for a meeting without some brand recognition, and they're not going to take the time to go look at look it up, right? So that sort of value added email of some place where you can add value to them, that's in conjunction with them having some brand recognition, um, and some is probably understating it a yeah. lot, wow. um, is is. I believe is still going to be effective. We still though will not put up the 30 to 40 meetings a month numbers that yeah. we were seeing. And because those 30 to 40 meetings a month, number, those were filling the pot. Now that's like, what's the number one theme? Ideal customer profile. It's like 14 years, 15 years, whatever of people saying, you got to get more targeted. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. They'd go, yeah, let's go do this. Craig Topo, let's go do this ICP exercise. Then it's like, where is it? Oh, it's over there on the shelf. Now you can't afford that. We got to choose the account with the type of accounts and markets we go after. And we got a brand to them. We got a market to them. We can send messages to them in conjunction with those things. Uh, events have become like mission critical. If you were getting pe not trade show booths in a, like in, in, in a isolation, like, hosting things, getting people face to face, getting in front of people, being where they are. Um, all of those things are critical, but you know, it's very hard to do in a mass marketing type of way. You have to identify who that sort of segment of accounts that you're going to go after to go do that. So I'll answer your questions. Do I think um, SDRs are dead? The current incarnation is, is it's fleeting, right? But like the next, there everyone's got a pipeline problem and otherwise Matt's going to get gray hair finally, because he's going to have to fill the entire funnel across every segment and market. It's just not going to work. Then what's also not going to work is going, Oh, well, the sales reps need a prospect. Now I'm not saying they don't, but they can never get the volume we were at before. We're just not going to get there. So there has to be that solution in the middle. Uh, automation is, is truly, I think we'll see, um, you know, I believe that we'll have uh, basically autonomous inbound SDRs in the next couple of years. That that that's that's like happening today. Like, mm -hmm. we don't need to hire people to go in there and make sure that a lead gets routed to them and that they follow up with when X amount of minutes and whatever, and it's all a template like that. Then that will allow us to focus on the the, the enterprise reps, the target account reps. Um, from an SDR perspective and work in conjunction with the brand and with marketing and create some, high, you know, high value messaging. The other thing too, is like, if you do build the brand, one of the biggest killers, in my opinion, is the offer to have a meeting to find out more about what's happening in their life to see if it's a fit. That is not high value, right? Unless they, you know, came in for a demo. We have to figure out what they want to talk about. And whether we've built the trust, um, a grit based authenticity on the market that allows them to believe that we are the right people to go talk to about that. Uh, those are new things. Those are things we haven't had to do before. And we're going to have to go look at. So Judd, the previous incarnation of just batch and blast SDRs is dead. I think inbound SDRs are going to transform into more autonomous. I think outbound there's, um, if people are still doing mass market outbound, that will probably become more automated. And then on the high value accounts, automation will help. But like at the end of the day, we have to find a way as a group to figure out what it is that those people want to talk about, what will resonate. Um, and, and that's going to be the key to that next level of SDRs. But with the caveat, it'll never be the numbers that we used to have. Never. Wow. You know, those are all great points. And and I agree with asking that question because, man, I don't have clarity on this. Yeah, you know, it's, tough. it's tough. Um, I, I started in the business as an SDR. And that was before the MarTech revolution. So you didn't have any tools at your disposal. <clears throat> and it was email and there was websites, but you just didn't have the digital tools. Or you could say crutches in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It taught you the in order to be successful, you had to build the muscle to generate activity that then led to 
understanding the customer's context a bit better to win. Um, I feel like I the the biggest way that I'm looking at this right now. I guess I didn't really grammatically make any sense, but I'm um, you know public school Wait, guy. Grip um, based, grip based authenticity. We just keep saying grip based. It's great. I I I I take I actually wrote down multiplier at every step because that's such a <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is our economy actually. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Multiplier, multiplier at every step because I agree with that. That's an excellent term, and and when you think about that, that's what you need. Um, is to to look at the roles and responsibilities starting at the highest level, the most valuable individual contributor roles in an organization. And look at the activity that they're doing and that they need to do in order to be successful and then stack rank that those activities. And at the end of the day, you're trying to make them more efficient. And to your point, it's not the same quantity. So you're going to have to make it up with quality and the age old adage of quality, you know, back in the day it was quality and quantity, right? Thanks. I'll take everything. Thank you so much. Um, but trying to create um, more efficiency for the highest quality activity that an individual can do in these high tech based go to markets. Yeah. And depending upon the size, it totally changes the company in the maturity of the category and all that stuff. So I take this with a caveat because when you're in a big company, you've got whole sorts of resources that are high value. Um, smaller companies, it's not the same. Um, but what I would say is simplicity oriented Think You look at this like the account executive and the customer success manager, in my opinion, are the two most highly valuable resources. And the CSM, I don't view as a revenue chaser as much. And this is debatable depending on the size, but that they are focused on generating value, generating adoption, and all the things that come from an implementing, managing, and maintaining, and then optimizing your, your solution. So then you unpack that to decide what is it you need to do in order to take, to free them up to do that the best they can with the highest value activities. And with an AE, let alone a CSM, you're going to get to the point where you need to create pipelines. So then you go back to an SDR or BDR. And you, as we all know, um, you're asking the least experienced person in the entire company to do the hardest job in the company, which is to generate net new awareness and demand. And I, although it is an amazing experience and I did it myself and I still remember it like it was yesterday, Craig, when you and I were in it at Pure Software with Stecker and that whole crew of people that were amazing. And you were literally trying to make the people that you're trying to win, trying to make the most, most calls, have the most conversations and make the people around you laugh the most. At least that's what we did. And I thought that, that created the best environment and was also the funnest. And that was also back in the early days when they first started to have cappuccino and espresso machines in an office. And I first start, started drinking those. You'd literally be powering them all day, laughing, di dialing and just trying to, get people into conversations to generate meetings, opportunities, and win. And so this is what I'm really struggling with right now on the SDR and BDR front. What is the activity that they can be successful at? Not just doing things that aren't adding value or creating conversion, engagement, conversion, whatever it is, but what is the activity that you need them to do where they can actually have success and they won't be spinning their wheels given all that context that you guys just rightly laid out. This yeah. is where I am i don't have clarity and I'm trying to figure it out every single day because it's so challenging to figure out what they can do where they can be successful at it. How do you get them out over their skis? And yes, it used to be, well, they're not on the phones. They're not in the office. They're not making calls. And it's like, well, look at their email stats and look at their calendars and all these things that you would do to quantitatively look at somebody's effort um, or qualitatively look at what they're doing that actually is adding value and creating a next step, yeah. a meaningful next step. And this yeah. is the challenge, this quality over quantity thing for BDRs, marketing organizations, sale, selling organizations, CS organizations. I find that that isolating the highest value activities 
of what the the roles in the organization have to do, um, and then pulling out the lower value activities they need to do to see if the other roles within the organization can do that to help make them more successful, more efficient, more productive, all that kind of good stuff. So that's why I look at that whole personalization journey that you guys are talking about. Awareness is step one. Then you want to create some level of personalization or massive so to uh, to create a level of engagement. So you the more you engage, the more you're likely to convert. And we all know you want to get higher and wider in an organization. So you got to do it somewhat at scale. And you got to find out who the right people are. This is just all of it <laughs> has yeah. to happen. Everything that you guys are talking about has to happen. And at the end of the day, you have to create multipliers at every step. There he is. By the way, let me just mention one thing on the part of this next revolution on the SDR side will be tech. Because the latest bump we had was uh, contacts, because Ted and I used to have to use magazine subscriptions, and sales engagement tools. This next layer of AI will start to, I, I'm not that guy that just always uh, gravitates to it, but you can see it. Yeah. Right We're there, it's going to take away Monday tasks on the SDR side. And it's going to be able to look at all the things that work and don't work and be able to put that stuff in front of SDRs. And so anyway, I'm ex I'm I'm excited for us all as an industry to solve it. But yeah. it's a multiplier economy based on grit based authenticity, sometimes leveraging what I like to call a concierge based selling process or wait. That, <laughs> that's the trifecta right there. <laughs> yeah. You guys right. are completely blonde. What's that? You ever see the movie Legally Blonde? Of course. I mean, well, not of course. I mean, yeah, I've heard of people that have seen it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Ted, you're coming back in just to get him to say stuff like that. <laughs> movie, and Reese Witherspoon is the star of it. She's amazing in the movie. My favorite, and this reminds me based on what Judd just said, as he likes to call, because that term is so rad and pompous in the same sense. Do you remember the attorney that came out of the of the courtroom? He's being in interviewed on the front steps of that courthouse and they asked him you know mr counselor how do you expect to win the case and he looked into the camera and he said i like i plan on using a little something i like to call strategy <laughs> and with that okay pal right? <laughs> oh big time in it with that all right hey, well, hey, thanks, hey, Ted. appreciate let, it let, what one thing Ted, for all the people watching and listening What's the one thing they should be either thinking about doing or trying to change to improve and get get things kind of growing again? Oh man, I it's human trait. Um, you know, humans are inevitably curious. Putting aside sellers, customers, everything, human beings in this time where the whole world seems like a freaking powder keg, shit's going down everywhere, let alone the economic environment. It's just I feel like curiosity ultimately wins. And I feel like if you think through that lens of trying to create value through education to Craig's point about events and activities together that helps people learn more and help learn what other people just like them are doing and opening up that aperture of curiosity and willingness to change in a highly passionate way I just feel like it's not rocket science. I just feel like that's the best thing that we could be doing. Awesome. Go. Thanks, Bye. Ted. Go dogs. See you guys. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Later. Ted. Hey, like your I, haircut. I, thanks, man. I thanks for tuning in to GTM Unfiltered. To hear our innovative insights and strategies, visit gtmunfiltered.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time.